Good evening. Oh, thank you very much. You are there. That's terrific. My name is Dick Whitley. I am the Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Larkspur, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this evening's presentation of Hooked on Marin. And if we could have the next slide, please. I have to keep up with my slides. And absent that, we'll go to the next slide, which has to do with uh, recognizing the folks who have worked really very diligently, very hard to bring this event to you this evening. And uh, those public agencies involved are the College of Marin, the Town of Corte Madera, the Larkspur Library, the City of Larkspur, the Town of San Anselmo, and in particular, um, the Drake Theater is part of the Tamalpais Union High School District um, series of campuses. And they have been extremely generous in getting us set up here tonight. And in addition to that, I would like to thank all the students who are here this evening, who are donating their time as far as I know. And uh, I think we paid them in pizza and soft drinks. They're very easy. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So um, our thanks go out to the Tam Union High School District and to the students who are here this evening making this thing happen. Thank you. Absolutely. And at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening's presentation. Mr. Terry McGovern is one of the Bay Area's most versatile performers. Terry started his movie career working for George Lucas, and his credits include Star Wars. He has also appeared in American Graffiti, Mrs. Doubtfire, and Nine Months. Terry also teaches commercial and character voice, as well as scene and monologue acting at his own Marin Actors Workshop and at the College of Marin. Please help me welcome Terry McGovern. Help me. It's for you. Thank you, Dad. My pleasure. There he is, named Donnery. Nice round of applause. Why does everything have to be named smart now? Have you noticed that? Smartphones. This is smart water. And it doesn't work. Trust me. And I will give you perfect examples of that tonight. It's a great pleasure to be here. As the saying goes, it's a great pleasure to be anywhere. But I love being in this theater because uh, both of my sons went to Drake. And the younger son did a lot of uh, acting uh, here at uh, Drake Theater with the great David G. Smith. Did they give it to Louis? What happened? All right, folks, a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, a pleasure and honor because it's, it's uh, great, always great to be in on the ground floor of something, uh, something that really is worthwhile, substantive, and brings people together. That's, that, that's my kind of event. That's my kind of uh, uh, thing to get involved in. But also because I get to learn the things that I know nothing about are, are amazing. You could fill the Library of Congress with my empty books. And I'm always, uh, I'm always anxious to learn more, and I think that's one of the great things about these forums because they give us a chance to learn in a, in a different way. We're not reading, we're not watching television, but actually uh, getting a chance to uh, have people come out who are experts in fields, talk about it, and then have a chance to uh, do a little Q&A at the end of the evening. And I'm fascinated by this subject ever since we moved here uh, pr probably 35, 40 years ago. Uh, raising kids. Uh, and it's funny, we do so many things because we have kids. Who knows if I would know anything about the Miwoks if we hadn't uh, taken the, the boys out to, to the coast and, uh, you know, explored and uh, gotten to know a little bit about the uh, coastal Miwoks. But despite the fact that the brochures were written very, very well, they were only brochures. The story goes much, much deeper than that. It's much broader than that. It's rich in history. And we're very lucky to have people uh, right here in our own community uh, who understand their subject uh, so brilliantly. Um, this is, by the way, the first installment of our Hooked on Marin series for the season 2013 through 2014, our second year. Uh, our purpose is to bring together the many and diverse interests of, in particular, this unique place where we live, Marin County. Our guests are going to be helping us discover California's most fascinating and endure of, uh, enduring Native American tribes, the Miwoks. Uh, you're going to be amazed at just how important the Miwoks were and are to all of us here in Marin. 
But before we get there, but first, this important announcement. I want to mention, and I'll do this quickly, that uh, our Hooked on Marin series is very proud this year to have such a wonderful subject to kick things off with. Uh, next month, again here at the Drake Theater, we'll meet Mr. Lauren Peterson. He is the visual uh, effects director for all of the Star Wars movies, uh, all of the Indiana Jones movies, Men in Black, E.T., and he's a fascinating guy. I've known Lauren for years, and he's going to bring great slides and some of his artifacts here as well. Uh, and that'll be on Wednesday evening, November 20th at Drake. Wednesday, December 4th, it'll be Trains in Marin, uh, Past and Future. Our venue in that night will be the Corte Madera Community Center, and our guest speaker will be Richard Torney. He'll tell us how for 40 years, and I don't know if you like trains the way I do. I have a real romantic uh, place in my heart for trains. Uh, yeah? Love stories on trains, you know, the Orient Express and all that. Well, we didn't exactly have the Orient Express here in Marin, but for 40 years, we had glean, uh, green, pardon, glean, we had, we had green electric trains that connected Fairfax, San Rafael, San Anselmo, and Mill Valley, and if you're a train buff like I am, you're not going to want to miss that, Wednesday, December 4th. And again this year, it'll be Marin County Rock and Roll Musical History. Our guide will be the College of Marin instructor, Richie Unterberger. He'll have archival video, audio footage, and great stories about Marin artists, Marin rockers in particular. And we'll be joined by my good friend Ben Fong Torres of Rolling Stone Magazine and the San Francisco Chronicle. That will be Marin Rock and Roll on January uh, 15. Okay, so we got a plug in for the series. Now, before I yield uh, the floor to our guests, I'd like to mention, in case you didn't have time to linger at the tables just outside the theater, there are numerous Miwok artifacts on display along with copies of the wonderful books uh, written by our speakers and additional material out there as well. So, uh, before we get there, uh, let me introduce our guests. No one knows more about the Miwok uh, Nation than Betty Girk and Ralph Shanks. They have a deep, and if I can say also, a very scholarly knowledge of their subject. Ralph Shanks is an anthropologist specializing in Native American basketry studies. Together with his talented colleague and wife, Lisa Wu Shanks, they began the Indian Baskets of California and Oregon series. Ralph is the author of two volumes of the History Baskets uh, rather, of history baskets in Central California. Now, our other guest is Betty Girk. Betty has been teaching anthropology and archaeology at the College of Marin for over 30 years. Is that right, Betty? More than that. You're becoming an archaeological site yourself. <laughs> I know the feeling. Um, she has uh, conducted archaeological field work here in California, in Colorado, in Holland, Kenya, and India, and has authored books and articles and produced several videotapes, including Archaeology Questioning the Past and her book on the man who gave our county its name, Chief Marin, Leader, Rebel, and Legend. Has anyone approached you on getting the movie rights for that? That's a pretty, pretty good story. So without further ado, let's bring this wonderful expert on the coastal Miwoks up here as our first speaker, Betty Girk. Betty, great to have you here. Thank you very much. We haven't had a chance to rehearse it, so Thank you. from the hip. Carrie wants me to speak with the enthusiasm and vigor that he has. Well, sure. But I'm not as young as you are. That's what you think. <laughs> Get the driver's license out. <laughs> okay. So as you can see, we all speak Coast New Walk. <clears throat> you comfy? Pardon? You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, good. <laughs> Look at that landscape. Thanks to the parks, and MMWD, the Muir Woods National Monument, the seashore, we have so much to remember of what the life must have been like, what the environment must have been like for the native people. And we still have occasional mountain lions, and we have one bear that visited us in 2003. 
Maybe some of you remember it was first sighted in Point Reyes, uh, then in Kirby Cove at Golden Gate, and one of the last spots was at the Zen Center at Muir Woods, sitting on top of a garbage dump, <laughs> meditating. <laughs> Now, our county was named by Mariano Vallejo, a general, uh, after somebody he knew, Chief Marin, and he knew him at Mission San Rafael because Marin had approached him uh, with text in hand and complained with other Indians about the fact that the Indians were being beaten at Mission San Rafael and he wanted to put a stop to it. He worried Vallejo enough so that in a short space of time, uh, the whipping stopped. This is the best picture we will have of Chief Marin. We're not sure actually it is Chief Marin, but it's a man of his community, and there were only two leaders in 1816 when this drawing was made of a obvious Indian leader. He's wearing a, a, a clamshell necklace, uh, and he's wearing also a mission blanket. Can you all hear me? Yes. Same thing? Okay. <clears throat> I wish I could tell you it was Chief Marin, but it's close as we can get. At least he's one of two people. And unfortunately, fortunately, the Indians didn't have to wear their Indian blankets all the time. On occasions, special occasions on Sunday afternoons, they could dress up in their ceremony regalia. Uh, and you can see here this same artist who drew the previous picture do this one also at Mission Dolores in 1816, and they're wearing feathered costumes of feathers and beads. Now, the priest kept accurate records of each person who came in. And so Chief Marin was baptized. Uh, he was given the number 2182. And you can see his name, Marino, on the left. I hope you can make that out. And then all the rest of the material is about how old he was, 20 years old, what area he came from, Southern Marin, uh, and his native name, with Musa. So what happened to Chief Marin was that he came in with the name Hut Musa. After two weeks of lessons in, in Catholic teaching, he was given the name Marino after a saint. Uh, after a while, he began calling himself Marine. And when the Americans came, they didn't understand the accents of the Spanish, and they pronounced it the name as they saw it, Marin. And now, of course, today, we know him as Chief Marin, and that's really thanks to Vallejo, who applied that uh, title in front of his name uh, because he was indeed a leader, at least at the mission. But there are many leaders around uh, Marin County. This is a map of coast Miwok words that are still on our landscape. And I'm going to take you a, on a tour of many of the places that are listed on the map, particularly those in Marin County. And I'm going to start at the top with Mount Tam. <coughs> Tamalpais is a coast Miwok word meaning Bay Mountain. And at the turn of the century, we understand it was pronounced Tamalpai by the native people who lived out of Bodega, also the coast Miwok territory. And it comes in all kinds of faces. Here where we, we are embraced by Tam, or Tam is embraced by, by snow, uh, wrapped around with snow, and here wrapped around in a mystery, mysterious phase. And I like this picture particularly because it tells you something that I want you to remember about the Coast Miwok and their attitude toward Mount Tam. They looked at it as a dangerous spot, a spot to be wary of, uh, because they believed that poisoners lived on the mountain uh, and that who could bring harm to them or even to kill them. They believed in evil spirits, uh, on the mountain and in the woods, the redwoods uh, at the base of the mountain. So the next story I'm going to tell you about uh, the mountain and Chief Marin, uh, well, you can understand a little better knowing their attitude toward the mountain, a place that to be treated with respect uh, but not to be visited. On an early morning in the 1830s, Chief Marin was part of a surveying party that was to go up uh, was to survey all the lands of San, San Rafael Mission. And 
this surveyor, Jacob Lees, got out on the property and said that the Indians were to go up and survey a spot on the mountain, and they refused. They didn't want to be involved in, in uh, any kind of danger. So the surveyor went up, mark, put a mark on where he wanted the mountain, came back and showed them that he had gotten up there safely. And she, for him not to be outdone, uh, went up the mountain too, laid his shirt on the branch that the uh, lease had put up there, and came back down and surprised his fellow Indians because when they saw him come without a shirt, they thought it had been taken off by some dangerous spirit. Uh, and when they realized what, what Myrna had done, they looked at him with in renewed amazement and, uh, rever and uh, reverence. Now, some of you have heard of the story of the mountain as being sleeping maiden, a stone maiden, and that's not a Coast Miwok story. The Coast Miwok story is about a rock giant, not a, not a princess, not a rock princess. Uh, and that story tells about a large rock that lived on the mountain and could speak and caused trouble. Uh, and two boys shot at its neck, uh, made out of abalone shells, and killed the uh, rock giant. And he burst open into many pieces, and all the rocks that you see on the mountain are the result of the rocks that had once made up one big rock for the rock giant. At Bolinas, individuals uh, lived around both sides of Bolinas Bay, Bolinas Lagoon, excuse me, And here at the mouth of Bolinas Lagoon, uh, they could gather olivella shells. And these shells are made into beads, which the Indians wore on their clothing and put on their baskets. Now, the story of the people of Bolinas is, is a sad one, because over 80% of the Indians who were baptized at Mission Dolores died of these terribly infectious diseases for which they had no immunity. And they did it in a very short space of time, in about two years, in the early 1800s. I want to show you how the people who call themselves Gualan, not Bolinas, how they, their name changed from Gualan to Bolinas. <clears throat> the Spanish heard Gualan, and when they wanted to talk about more than one Gualan, they called them Gualanes, the plural. And when a land grant was constructed for the, um, a non-Indian in the 1840s uh, for this property around Bolinas, they named the area Bolinas. And from that, we have Bolinas. That's why I consider it still a Coast Miwok word. Now, some of you may, <laughs> when you first may have, when you first came to um, Marin County, looked for the sign for Bolinas. And you can look and look, and you're not going to find it. Uh, and the Wall Street Journal found this so amusing that they had it on the front page of a newspaper in 1985. And they mentioned that uh, 34 times the county came out and put signs, and 34 times the this, this signs were defaced or torn up. So you might be surprised to hear that in 1915, the city of Bolinas uh, contracted to have this landscape painting done, uh, 17 foot, feet long, and put up at the entrance of Bolinas. I don't know how long it stayed there, but it was certainly gone in the uh, late 20s, and bef perhaps before that. Turning to Olima, this is another Coast Miwok uh, word, uh, and we're moving now northward on our tour of Coast Miwok sites. <clears throat> and as you can see, the population is very small, but it had a very large significance to a ship that came into Limantour uh, at Point Reyes in 1595. The ship was wrecked, uh, and Sermeno and his, some of his sailors marched over the ridge in the background to this village, to Olima, and an associated village known as Olima Loque. And the Indians shared acorns with them, and um, herbs and thistles, so that when they left, they had uh, some food to take with them. Uh, fortunately, they had a boat that they could put together, uh, which was just a long rowboat, and they squeezed 80 people in that boat and made it to Mexico in a month. Uh, quite an amazing story in itself, but they were helped all along the way by Indians. 
Now, Olima has a sign problem, too. Okay, on our trip around the Coast of uh, landscape, we're moving now to Tamales Bay. Now, the, there were Indians west of Whites Hill and up through, um, along the east shore of Tama, Tamales Bay and through Nicasio, and they were known as Tamales. And here is, a, again, probably an example of the um, Spanish uh, making a plural out of tamal, as in tamales. Uh, and, of course, that's so similar to tomales, you, can, you have no trouble uh, understanding how that word is still on our landscape uh, in, the, in this form. Indians lived in villages on both sides of Tamales Bay. Uh, and here is a map of these wonderful names that no longer are part of our vocabulary, such as down here on the right, Sishqui, Segloque, Morococha, uh, <clears throat> but although the names were no longer used uh, by 1850 or 60, uh, the people still lived in that area. Uh, Coast Miwok were still living there between the railroad tracks and, and, the, and the water and, 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 the, and Tamales Bay. Okay, moving uh, east now. Uh, fortunately, Olimpale was a, also a village, uh, and this name has been retained, uh, and in the mid, uh, in 19, excuse me, at the mid-century mark, not, not do I mean mid-century, no, I mean between uh, 1890 and 1900, uh, this town was, or this village was referred to as Oyampai, again by the Bodega Miwoks. The village itself was a little higher than this elevation, but I chose this photograph because I wanted you to see the water in the distance and realize this is all marshland. It was a very rich environment for the people who lived here. And it was also on the important road from San Rafael south uh, and to up to Petaluma and farther north. And from Petaluma, the trade could come down the obsidian from Santa Rosa and from San Rafael and points to the coast, uh, the clamshells would come in. So it was a very important spot. <clears throat> And we know the one of the Indians who lived there, Camilo, wasn't born at, Camo, at uh, Olimpale, uh, but when the Capitan or the head of Olimpale died, he married his wife and then became the head of uh, Olimpale. He also was able to get a grant of land from the Mexican government, uh, a rare occurrence. And today we have the remains of his adobe uh, still preserved, which you can see when you visit Olimpale State Park. Okay, now let's take a look at the Spanish names that were given to Indians. They're, the, they're in red, and the other Cosmuoc names are in blue. So continuing our trip, uh, we'll start with Nicasio. And can you see it down here in the lower left? Right down here. I've included this Google picture because I wanted you to see the old Rancheria Road because this is the road that leads out to Echetamal, a very important village for the Coast Miwok, uh, the village where Maria Copa came from, and she was one of the informants in the 1930s who gave and shared so much information with an anthropologist from Berkeley uh, about the culture of the native people. So Nicasio was a Coast Miwok who was baptized at Mission Dolores, and very similar to Chief Marin, who was baptized in his 20s, uh, so was Nicasio baptized in his 20s, and he probably came over uh, in 1817 when the Mission San Rafael was established, uh, and he came out to Nicasio, what is now what we call Nicasio, probably to H. Tamal, and came to this area and was a sheep herder. It was also a, um, an area where there, were t uh, where there were cattle as well. Now, the very large land grant granted to the Indians in 1835 uh, was taken away from them uh, very cleverly by the governor of Mexican governor of California, General Vallejo, uh, and uh, the Secretary of State. 
And you can see here the, oops, sorry. You can see the uh, other land grants, Olimpali, and down here, Bolinas. Okay, I want to turn to the three, what I call the three sons. San, or San Anselmo, San Geronimo, and San Quentin. And I've been curious whether these are named after Indians or not. And the only way you can really know is to look through the mission records. So let's take a look at an early picture of San Anselmo. This is from 1903, and the Indians had left the area maybe 50 or 60 years earlier, but you can still get a sense of the valley itself. I did find some Anselmos. I looked through four different mission records, the birth, marriages, and deaths, and found two, two Anselmos, and they were um, baptized at Mission San Rafael. One was a young boy, age four, and his grandfather, age 60. And the reason that was something I could never forget, because when I translated uh, this record, it said that the elderly San Anselmo, I shouldn't call somebody who's 60 elderly, since at 20 years my junior, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the um, the priest wrote that the Anselmo had been mauled by a bear, and he thought he was near death, and he baptized him and figured he would uh, not survive. And frequently when, this, when somebody was baptized near death, the priest didn't include the death record. And sure enough, I didn't see the death record until four years later he survived the attack. Uh, and in the meantime, had married his wife, Anselmo, an official marriage at uh, San Rafael. And the witness at the wedding was Geronimo. Cool. So here is the Valley of Geronimo with Spirit Rock uh, right here. Maybe a little, probably as perspective that you haven't seen it before, haven't seen before. And Geronimo was a very important character at Mission San Rafael. He too was born uh, in uh, Coast New York territory in his, and went to the mission, Dolores, in his 20s uh, and probably came across uh, to San Rafael about the same time uh, as did uh, Mar Marino and became, as Marino was, a leader at the San Rafael mission. He was a nurse, interpreter, uh, a frequent witness at weddings, including Anselmo, uh, and he accompanied the priest out west to Tamales uh, to baptize Indians. And the priest was particularly concerned about Indians uh, who, were, uh, who weren't uh, strong enough to come into the mission. He wanted to get out there and baptize them. There are more stories to tell, but there isn't time. I'm sorry. Mm -mm. And this is a lovely landscape drawn by a local artist giving you the other perspective of Spirit Rock and San Geronimo Valley. OK, this picture is taken from um, Ring Mountain. I'm standing on Ring Mountain and looking across at San Quentin. And we're going to try and figure out if San Quentin was indeed uh, named after an Indian. Well, I hope if you read my book, you know indeed that it was. And what happened was that. Uh, Vallejo, when he described the life of the Coast Milk Indians, particularly when he named the county, he mentioned that Marino or Marin or Marine uh, had run away from the mission and had fled and had fled with somebody named Canteen. And in this experience, they were chased by the military because you weren't supposed to, you weren't allowed to leave the mission unless you had a pass. Uh, and the military found a, a canteen here at Point Canteen. And the same thing happened to this name as happened to the other names. Uh, Continu evolved to Contino, which the name he was baptized with evolved to Canteen. And the English, the Americans, excuse me, couldn't pr pronounce it correctly, so they said Quentin, as it, they, saw, they saw it spelled. And now we know it as San Quentin, and it's a good example of canonizing a boatman.
They cost me rock boatmen. <coughs> so here is the area where uh, Canteen was caught by the military. And they were after Marin, who was hiding out on these islands, which were named after him and were named after him at the time. So he was probably hiding out on East Marin because West Marin today is a rookery for herons. And of course, I can't say for sure that's what it was in 18, uh, early 1800s. But the military had cleverly uh, engaged a, another boatman uh, from the East Bay, uh, not a friend of the Coast Milwaukee, and he helped them look for Chief Marin on the island. Perhaps this, this is a view that will help you understand how close the island was to the land. We're standing on San Pedro Road, just off of San Pedro Road in San Rafael. So he could have taken his tule boat back and forth from here, that there's the marshes right near there where you can still see them today. And he took his tule boat back and forth uh, and possibly um, was able to evade capture. But the story in Mill Valley in the, in the late 18, 1800s uh, was that Marin had used a snorkel made out of a reed to get back and forth and to evade his captors. So in these last slides, whether you're traveling across the Golden Gate Bridge, and entering Marin County, or whether you're traveling on the other bridge and heading toward San Quentin, or taking the ferry to San Francisco, you are traveling through Coast Miwok history. So this is a legacy of the Coast Miwok this trip that we've had, and you can have today too. A legacy of the Coast Miwok, which has endured because of the Coast Miwok place names on our map. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Just fantastic. We're so grateful to have you here tonight, Betty. Can we get, bring up the lights a little so Betty can? Navigate the stage for us. There we go. Again, another applause. Thank Round you. of applause. Ready to go. Wow. Oh, is, be careful there. Oh, okay, good. I love those. I love the uh, early shots of places where we live. Don't you love that shot of uh, San Anselmo? What was the long road in that shot of San Anselmo? There was a. Was that Sir Francis Drake? Yeah, it was. Okay, well, well, well I, I'm going to move things along, so we'll save uh, time for folks to ask questions, too. I want to mention something about both of our guests tonight, that they are members of MAPOM. That's with an M, but it is pronounced MAPOM. And it is the Miwok uh, Archaeological Preserve of Marin. And it was founded back in 1970 as a result of community involvement in the excavation of a coast Miwok village site. And uh, that's how this organization came to be and how they've done such a wonderful job preserving uh, the history, the cultural heritage of these people. I also want to mention our uh, Hooked on Marin's website. It's very simple. Uh, Maypalm.com, hookedonmarin.com. And both of our websites work. <laughs> you cannot get health insurance at either one, but they do work and they do their job. Let me bring up here now our next guest. He is a fascinating guy. As I mentioned, uh, uh, he and his wife are uh, renowned experts on the subject of basket weaving uh, here in California, Louise Wu Shanks, uh, together with her husband. Uh, Ralph is the author of two volumes of the history of baskets in Central California. Let's learn more about these wonderful Native American people from our next guest, Mr. Ralph Shanks. Thank you. This is a Miwok song, or actually a Maidu song from California. 
Putim yo ho, putim yo ho, putim yo ho, ye kunai, ye kunai, ye kunai, putim yo ho, ye kunai, ho. Thank you. <laughs> this uh, shirt that I'm wearing is a Muskogee Creek. Um, ribbon shirt from Oklahoma. Um, I'm um, of Scottish and uh, English ancestry, but a part of my ancestry is Abenaki, which is an Eastern U.S. Indian culture in um, um, Maine and uh, Quebec. I, I'm also the president of the Miwok Archaeological Preserve of Marin Maypalm, and I want to thank Terry and everyone for inviting me to speak here. Uh, the reason I'm talking about um, California Indian baskets is that there was nothing as important as California Indian baskets in native California culture. And uh, Jason, do you want to, Jackson, do you want to go ahead and start our first slide? Great. This is a really great example of a San Francisco Bay native basket. If you look at it, there, there's all kinds of wonderful things on it. There's, um, the beads are primarily olivella shell disc beads, and then around the rim, there's clamshell disc beads, and then the red that you see on it, those are from the woodpecker scalps. Now, baskets in California permeated everyone's life from birth until death. When you were born, you were typically washed in a basket, a baby washing basket, you'd be put in a newborn cradle for about a month, and then you'd be moved into a regular baby cradle until you could get it grow out, grow that. All your life, there would be, your food would be cooked each day in California Indian baskets. There would be, it would be winnowed and gathered, collected in, in baskets, served in baskets. As you got older, um, when you got married, there would be baskets um, f and for your wedding to celebrate that. Beautiful baskets like this one that's a feather and shell bead decorated basket. There were even um, divorce baskets. Those were, th th those were big here in Marin, no. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but anyway. Um, divorce baskets were interesting because they were a way in which um, if a woman was getting a divorce, she made a basket as a gift to the woman who would soon be her ex-mother-in-law. Well, you think about that. People were living in communities with 25 to maybe 150 people, and you know you want to get along with everybody. So one person that you didn't want to be your enemy was your ex-mother-in-law. So that was a big one, and of course, it went through your whole life. There were baskets for every special ma major uh, event in your life, clear until your death. And especially if you're a woman, there would be baskets burned in your honor when you passed away. Okay, Jackson. Now, California Indian baskets are really unrivaled in the world. When the first people came here to California, the thing that they, they one thing that they wanted to do was they wanted to bring something back to, um, to Europe, the first explorers did. And they tried to bring what was the best thing that you could find in California. And well, there was nothing that equaled baskets. Europeans couldn't make baskets in the quality that were made here in California. This is a really nice example. This is a Patwin basket. The Patwin folks live up around Davis where I teach it. You see Davis up in the valley. And um, baskets just like this were made by the Coast Miwok here in Marin. And you can see again the, the red woodpecker feathers. You look on there, you can see carefully if you look, bluebird feathers, mallard duck feathers, and then you can see clamshell disc beads. And then there's the tips at the end of each of the pendant, which um, have abalone shell beads. And these beads were, were, these baskets were really, really prized, beautiful things. Okay, Jackson. Now this is a nice picture just to kind of get a feel for our state. This is a scene that all of us have seen. 
um, it looks out, it's looking toward Mount Diablo, and you can see um, food all over in that picture. In the foreground, there are salvia, sage seeds. You can see also, if you look, um, pine trees for pine nuts, oak trees for acorns, and of course, down in the valley, there's all the, uh, the, the water for the, the fish that were prevalent in this area. And then don't forget that California had deer, tule elk, and of course, um, antelope, huge populations of those. And there's wonderful stories of people traveling from San Rafael up to Sonoma and running into large herds of those animals, you know. And of course, there were bear, too. There were distinctive um, grizzly bears, which are a bit different looking than the grizzly bears that still survive up in uh, Montana and Alaska. Jackson? The other thing that some people don't realize that we should acknowledge is in California, Native people um, had their own knowledge of medicines, and Native healers in California still continue to do that. To this day, there are people, and there are people who are close friends of mine who've been um, healers or shaman. The Indian people usually call it Indian doctors. And this is a cascara plant during World War II. CC pills, which were a common cure-all, were got from the bark of cascara. And that's a native California plant. But there are actually entire books that deal with medicines from um, California Indian people. That was something that was very advanced by Native American standards here in our state. This is a, a really nice example of a Thule house. Um, there was an old saying among the wind too, in which it was, I live in a basket. And that kind of had the meaning that baskets were associated with you all your life, you literally, you know, from birth on. And people's houses too, this is a Thule house, were often very basket-like in, uh, in their appearance and the way they're constructed. I like to show this picture because it's actually a California Indian village site. If you look along here, I'm going to step over here so I hope everybody can hear me. Right along <coughs> here, if you look at the depressions in, the, in here, you can see that those are where houses were. And um, uh, here you can also see native foods. You can see the, um, uh, the oak trees. You can see the... Um, you can see the um, manzanitas up on the hillside, the, the pine nuts, and of course the, the grasslands and waters where you know, the animals and the fish and so on used. One of the things that's real, oh, would, thanks. You'd rather not be anchored. Would, would you rather have me use this instead? No, oh, okay, okay. okay, thanks. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, one of the things really interesting about native California is that there are virtually, there are almost no starvation myths. And you go to other parts of the United States, there's very commonly starvation myths. But in California, there aren't. And a lot of that seems to be because there, were plentiful, there was plentiful food here. This was a land of abundance. You know, I once um, picked up um, a copy of um, the flora of Iowa. And the, and the flora of Iowa was about this thick, you know, maybe a third of an inch. Well, if you've ever seen a book that's a flora of California, it's like three inches thick. And that's because we just have an incredible abundance of plants in the state. We have the tallest trees in the world, the largest trees in the world, the oldest trees in the world, the most diverse kinds of oaks, manzanitas, ceanothus, all here in this state. Wonderful things that were used in native California cultures. Now, the other thing is that, you know, not to re forget that fish were really important here. This is a Toloa fish camp. This still goes on today. Toloa people go up and they catch surfish, surf fish in their nets, and then they lay them out here on the beach to dry. You've got to be out there watching that you don't lose them to the seagulls or animals or peep other people. But they, th this is a big thing that's done each year up in Crescent City in the north part of our state. One of the things I want to really emphasize is California Indian cultures are still going. Native California people are still here. In my classes up at Davis, I've had a fair number of California Indian students there. 
This is a good example of California Indian family. This is Bill Franklin's family from up in the Sierra foothills. These folks are Sierra Miwok, linguistically related to the Coast Miwok of Marin County, and they're dressed up for, um, for a dance celebration there. Obviously, you, the, the people in the picture, you know, they have their jobs or they're going to school or whatever, but California Indian people do like to dress up in the traditional costumes many times for important events. This is underneath the oak tree place. This is a California Indian, this is David Smith, he's a Pomo. Pomo people are the native people just north of Marin County in Sonoma, Mendocino, and Lake. And if you look carefully, you can see he's got a traditional California headband on, which is made out of, um, of a flicker headband uh, from fl birds, flickers. And uh, it's kind of a nice feeling for you know the old time ways of being under the oak trees. This is a close up of David Smith. And you can see the orange um, headband with the quills of the flicker feathers. The belt was originally made out of native bird feathers, which were woven into a, um, a kind of a, a, of a broad belt. And um, the, on, uh, he's got f stuck up on there out of the, out of the belt are um, split stick clappers, which is just like this one that, um, excuse me, that John Littleton was nice enough to loan me. Basically, it's a percussion instrument, and it was important in California Indian music. These are four singers. Um, if any of you have been around, and I know some of you have here in Marin County a long time, um, on the right is Bun Lucas, and the other gentleman is uh, Lanny Panola, and then to, to the left here is Irene Panola. Irene was the last person, to my knowledge, in California who was monolingual in a native California dialect. She could only speak Pomo. Uh, she couldn't speak English, and Lanny would translate for her. Also, you can see they've got split stick clappers in their hands and singing a song. This is Bun and a group of dancers out at Point Reyes National Seashore. He's singing, they're dancing. This is Irene giving a prayer um, at Strawberry Festival that we used to have out at Point Reyes. Now this is a really neat picture because this is an example of how you cook acorn mush. Acorns were the most important food in California. Now you can't just eat an acorn, there's tannic acid in it, it's too bitter. And so you have to leach that out. Then after you leach, to leach it out, you've got to pound them up, the acorns, and get them as fine as to pass through a, um, a, a, a conventional uh, flour sifter at home. And then you, you run water through them carefully, and you eventually get the um, tannic acid washed out. And then it's really pretty good stuff. And you can cook it up, and you can make it into a mush, like they're doing here. And you can also make it into breads and, and cookies and cakes and things like that. And if you look there, you can see the one with the white acorn mush in it, and those stones in it are cooking stones. Because you, obviously you can't put baskets over a fire to cook. You've got to cook another way. And heated stones are fantastically efficient. I've seen acorn mush brought to a bowl, well, brought to a boil using um, cooking stones faster than you, I can do it on a gas stove at my house. Now, this is a really great example of a good California Indian basket. This is a cooking basket. Each basket's had its purpose. Um, and so what you do is a, a basket like this, you would put your acorn mush and your water in it, and you, then you'd move your cooking stones gradually through that. Each time they cooled down, you took them out and put another hot one in. So you rotated them through, and pretty soon it all brought to a boil and then people could eat it. Now people would sometimes eat them out of these uh, cooking baskets or sometimes they would be served separately. They're a wonderful way to, to cook things. Uh, Jackson, can you move her head down a little bit on that? Or anything? Yeah, thanks. Um, this is a painting that Grace Hudson did. She was a famous painter from up in Ukiah in Mendocino County. It's a Pomo woman. And you can see in one hand on her 
for far hand, she's got a seed beater. And those were used to knock little tiny seeds, like sage seeds, into a carrying basket to collect and eat. And then the other basket is a winnowing tray in which it was used to sift things um, to get things together that, so that you could eat them. But um, it's really, I think, a nice example. I like her face, too, and the way the, the whole painting looks. This is a young Pomo woman, also done painting by Grace Hudson. And she's um, shown with a group of baskets gathered together in honor of a wedding. And so what you can see there in the background and in her hands, you can see different beautiful pomo baskets that were used in a you know wedding celebration. Right here is a group of pomo people um, dancing together. This is the Brown family from up in Clear Lake. And this is all contemporary. I just want to really emphasize how when I was growing up as a kid, um, I didn't realize all these things that were going. I had friends who were California native people who were good friends of mine, but I didn't realize that the cultures were alive. And so it was a really a wonderful thing to me to get to develop friends from the native California society and, um, and be able to experience um, so many things that are still going on today. This is a picture of the Great Basin. The Great Basin, as you know, is east of California. Nevada's primarily, almost entirely, um, Great Basin. And Great Basin is really significant in California cultural history because um, we think that coil baskets, one of the two types, main types of baskets made in California, came into our area from the Great Basin. The first people that came into California, the first Native American people, in California, came down from the north, came down from what's now Oregon. And um, when I was first introduced to basketry, I started studying basketry when I was around 10 or 11. And then when I was, a, during my graduate student years, I worked with um, Larry Dawson, who was the senior museum anthropologist at UC Berkeley. And um, Larry um, worked out a, a very interesting analysis of basketry in which he started in Northern California and he followed basketry through Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, Alaska. And then he kept going. He went into um, Asia and he followed it through Asia, Eastern Asia and into Japan, clear to the Ainu people in Japan were the native people in, in Japan that I believe predated Japanese people there. And he found that the basketry connection all the way from Northern California through all those states and in that deep into Asia, it's all connected. Now, baskets of the early people in Japan are different from California, but there are subtle differences from one culture to another all the way around the coast across the Pacific down into our area. Of course, California Indian made, people made a lot of other beautiful things besides basketry. There's a, a, f a feathered belt there that's done in the predominantly yellow colors there. In the background, there's uh, rabbit skin blankets, and you can see uh, some moccasins from up in Northern California, but there's a lot of neat things there just to get, get you the feel of the beauty of our native cultures. This is an um, interesting basket. I, I grew up partly in San Rafael, but I also grew up in the Napa Valley. And um, in, the, in the Napa Valley, that's native home to the Wapo people, W-A-P-P-O. And I always look for Wapo baskets. And there are very, very few documented ones left. But this is a Wapo basket. And it's really interesting, too. If you look carefully, you can see here about the middle on the left, down on the side nearest me, you can see that there, um, there's a little rectangle there. And the WAPO seem to put that in on some of their baskets. And there's probably some religious reason for doing it, or it may have been just a, um, some other reason, but they're, they're there on their baskets. This is a twined basket. The um, red on it is a red bud, and um, that's a really common design material in our baskets in the state. This is Ava Salzar. 
Ava is a friend of my wife, Lisa, and mine, and she's uh, weaving a basket using juncus. Juncus is a, is a reed that's here in, in California. It's used especially in the southern half of our state. It makes wonderful, beautiful um, baskets. Ava's about 32 or 33. Um, good example of one of our younger weavers. Um, there are four or 500 people at least that are weaving here in California today that are native Californians. And um, she's actually one of the very best. This is Julia Parker. Parker. Julia is in her 80s. Um, she's a dynamic weaver too. Um, she's an interpreter at uh, Yosemite National Park up in the Sierras. And um, she's weaving as well in this. An example of a good example of an older weaver. But Julia's daughter, Lucy, weaves. Ursula, her granddaughter, weaves. And Naomi, her great granddaughter, weaves as well weaves as well. So you have four generations of native weavers um, going on in, in, in that group of, the, of people. Now right here just as a close-up of a basket, I want to mention a couple things here. One is that if any of you are interested in basketry, you should talk to me afterwards because I teach um, a class coming up in January. We're going to do a tour at um, Hearst Museum at UC Berkeley with all the baskets that are virtually never seen by the public. And you can sign up through College of Marin. J Jason can tell you how to do that. I'll be happy to help you with it as well. And the other thing is I teach up at UC Davis. And we usually have some room in my classes up there. So if you're interested in learning more about basketry, let me know because you know we might be able to fit you in to be a part of one of our classes up there. I live in Novato. It's a one hour drive from my house to UC Davis. It's not bad at all. So that's a good example here of a coil basket. If you look carefully at the starting knot, which is in the center, and you can see things are going around like a coiled rope from there. And that's one of the most popular and, um, and, and important styles of weaving in California. Probably that kind of baskets, coil baskets are made more than any other kind today, although still many twine ones are made as well. I like showing people this because this is a classic San Francisco Bay Area basket. Um, this is an Ohlone basket. The Ohlone people lived all along the East Bay, Contra Costa, Alameda, all the way south to uh, Monterey. They also lived in... Um, San Francisco down through the peninsula, um, San Jose, Santa Cruz areas as well. And again, what you're seeing on here, as I showed you earlier, you're seeing the Olivella disc beads. And you, if you look carefully, there still are some lovely um, feathers there from the uh, red feathers from the woodpecker. This is a close up of uh, weaving a. Uh, a coil basket there. I think Julia Parker's making this one. And just to give you a feel for it. Now, big baskets like a couple of the ones I've shown you, they can take up to two years to weave. Baskets take a long time to make. But um, they are really a fantastic thing. Virtually no one or very few people in California stopped weaving baskets and adopted pottery. Basketry was just so super important here. So I'm going to end with this last uh, basket here, and that's just another example, another beautiful San Francisco Bay basket. And I just want to mention also that my wife Lisa and I have our books, um, Indian Baskets of Central California in particular, which is on the basketry of um, this area, Coast Miwok, Ohlone, Pomo, Wapo, and so on available too. Plus, we'll answer your questions as well. Thanks very much. Ralph, um, two, it's actually two questions, if you don't mind. Um, the basket that they were cooking in and making the mush, I'm assuming they cleaned those, and how they how did how did they clean them, and how long did they last being used 
or, or so strenuously, it seemed. They would be washed, you know, and, and cleaned, and they would last a long time. Um, I've seen them up in the, UC Davis has a wonderful collection of California Indian baskets, and a lot of them were used so much, you could actually see them worn clear down through the bottom. The cooking stones would wear them out. So I would imagine they would last several years, you know. People took really good care of them. Okay. And the second question is, I've heard, and maybe you could confirm this, that most Coast Miwok baskets are, are not found in, in the local area, or they went to Europe or Russia? Is that yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, yeah, m most of our baskets from the Coast Miwok people of Marin and Southern Sonoma are in European collections um, in um, several different countries. They're in uh, Russia, they're in uh, Germany, they're in um, Swiss Switzerland, and so on. And what happened was when people would explore our areas, very often there would be educated people among the crew that were purposely sent to this area to bring back really important things from California. And baskets were obviously right up, you know, at the top of the list of things that were collected and they're in the museums there um, in various European ones. If you look in the chapter of my book, um, any baskets of Central California, you can see a number of those beautiful baskets that are in, 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 that are in Europe, and you can see them today. Thank you. Ralph. Betty, why don't you come on up and join Ralph, please? I, I know we have questions for you as well. And I was going to suggest, yeah, you guys can be comfortable. How about this? Always the director. Why don't you sit here, Betty? You'll have your microphone, and Ralph's got his. We're all set. Thank you. Okay. Great, good. Okay, back out to the audience, find out if we have any more questions. You are prepared for what, sir? Not with me. <laughs> hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Susan Scott. Hi, Betty. Do you have a question? Yes, for Betty. Oh, hi, Betty. Um, when did, I'm just thinking, when did you really get the idea that maybe you wanted to do this in-depth study of the Coast Miwok and do a book? When did, when and how Can did that? Can you hear me? Yeah. On? Yes, ma'am, it is. Uh, Susan, I didn't hear you, understand what, your question. When did, I, when did you get the idea and how did it all start where you want, decided you were going to do this in-depth study and do a book? <laughs> <laughs> how did that all start? Well, uh, my students and I were digging in Mill Valley uh, and we began researching the native people there and went back to Nels Nelson's notes. Nels Nelson was an anthropologist at, from UC Berkeley in 1907, who wandered around, I shouldn't say wandered, very carefully walked uh, Marin County and Sonoma County and East Bay uh, to record every extant site. And he said that Chief Marin was born in Mill Valley, my hometown. <laughs> so I began walking around and I found the place where he was born, and we know the name of the village now, thanks to the work of the mission records. And in a very short time, space of time, I had my students all involved. So we were busy translating the mission records, uh, San Francisco records and San Rafael in particular. And somehow, with all their work, I thought it should be made into a book. Uh, so that's, does that answer your question? It does, great, yes. Um, I'm just curious to know all the little uh, shells they're small, how did they make the holes in them without them shattering? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, they're, they're olivella shells about this big. Uh, and they had a drill, a church drill. And I think John probably has an example in the, in the back of the room there. And he can show you how they drilled the abalone and how they drilled the uh, olivella. That's, I don't mean abalone, how they drilled the clamshell. Uh, and out at Point Reyes every July, we have a, a, an opportunity for people to learn how to do that. Uh, and they made a hole and they, uh, well first they carved out an area that they could take from the shell, I'm talking about the clamshell beads now, and then they put those uh, blanks uh, on a piece of um, material that they made from perhaps leaves of iris and rolled it along a stone so it could become smooth on the outside. Uh, it's a long process. I'm not doing a, a good job telling you about it, but you can experience this yourself if you go to Cooley Loco uh, at big time. Thank you. 
Yeah. Great. Thank you, Betty. Anybody over on the other side? Can I come over? Anybody have any questions over there? I have a question. Linguistically, I mean, the language of, of these, uh, th th these native people. Uh, Ralph sang a song, and uh, I guess that was native Miwok. What was the language like in terms of syntax? I mean, uh, is it a broad and varied uh, vocabulary, or is it very limited and, and more intonation uh, uh, to differentiate uh, with intonation rather than words? What a question. Uh, do you want to tackle that or should I, Ralph? Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the Coast Miwok are called Coast Miwok because when the linguists looked at the language spoken in California, they realized that the people who spoke a language called Miwok in the Sierras was very similar to the language of people who spoke Miwok in around the Sacramento area, which is very similar to the language spoken in the, in the uh, Clear Lake area. And finally, they realized that there, this must be an ancient language um, and probably Coast Miwok uh, split away from the other languages about 2,000 years ago. And they looked for the magic words like I and mother uh, and some key words which are, were all identical. And that's what made them realize that this was all one common language. Does that help? Yeah, yeah well, that's, that, that, that's fascinating. Was, is it a written language or is it purely oral? No, it's purely oral. There, there were no written languages in California. But the amazing thing about California is there was more linguistic diversity in our, in our state than anywhere else in the country. If you look at linguistic maps of the United States, they're like, you take Ohio, basically Shawnee was the language that was spoken in Ohio. But here in California, if you start off here in Marin County and you go up um, to um, Fairfield, by then you're in another language. If you're in Sacramento, you're in still another language. You keep going into the Sierras, you're in a fourth language. You, by the time you're in Atajo, you've gone through five different languages. And there, there were even subgroups um, within that, too. So there was a huge amount of linguistic diversity here. That, too? Pardon? Yes. Right. Well, they lived in, in uh, unique areas. Don't take that personally. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just the... They... Uh, I don't want to give the impression that uh, there was a lot of traveling around, but there was travel so that people who lived near a border, as in, in the, po the Pomo uh, area, they could speak Coast Milwaukee and Pomo. And the people living in San Rafael could speak sure. Coast yeah. Walk and uh, the language on the East Bay. So Love they were, that. many of them were multilingual. They could speak three languages. And uh, out of 80 to 100 languages in California, it's quite amazing that there were so many. But your question has to do with, with why. Uh, and I think when you live in an area where there is some concern about your neighbors and whether they might be uh, friendly or not, and there was indeed right. concern about uh, sorcerers and um, uh, poisoners. Uh, and so they were very cautious about who they were when they left their own territory. And even when Chief Marin tried to leave uh, and escape from the mission, he couldn't go any place in California, even the, the East Bay, uh, because they might, may not receive, might not receive him uh, in a welcoming fashion. So they were not necessarily friends, and Mia Copa, who was interviewed, said that the Coast Miwok people, uh, the Tamales people didn't like the people up in Healdsburg, and the Healdsburg people didn't like somebody else, so they were just cautious. Sounds like Italy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, Italy, the, the, the same yeah. thing. The, 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 other thing, the other factor, too, is that along the coast, you had a big buildup of people immigrating here and staying here and basically dividing the, the, the state up linguistically. Um, in many different ways. So you don't see that on the interior. When you get into, say, Nevada and Utah, uh, Eastern Oregon, Idaho, all that area, you have you know, a relatively small diversity of languages. But all along the coast, California, to a bit of lesser degree in Oregon, Washington, but still a great deal, you have a huge amount of linguistic diversity. Any more questions? Yes, let me come around here. Yes, ma'am. 
So that raises the question about how do you determine if you have all the different Miwok subsets, but how do you distinguish between the Pomo and the Miwoks, and is it linguistic, is it ethnic, is it cultural? Yeah, basically um, the early anthropologists divided California up linguistically. That was, you know, the, the number one thing that they used. But as Betty mentioned, um, when you have, um, you, you had a, a, a greater diversity than that. Even within Coast Miwok speaking or Pomo speaking people, there was still greater diversity. I was once at a, um, a California Indian event up in Lake County, and there were people from uh, different groups of the Pomo around um, uh, Lake Mendocino um, and Sonoma counties. And what I noticed is that the people tended to just to sit with their groups. There was still, uh, even though most of the language has been forgotten, there still was this independence politically functioning from one group to another. A, a quick question, Ralph. Are there what we would technically call reservations for uh, California Native Americans, or is it more just a voluntary place where they, 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 they go and gather to their, at their ancestral sites? I love that question because it's really interesting. California has more Indian reservations than any other state. We have more Native American people in California than any other state. Wow. Um, Oklahoma has the second most, but, but most of the people that have been brought into Oklahoma were forced in there to live there, mm. whereas California Native people, you know, they're the original Californians. But, yeah, one of, the, one of the other things is some of the reservations have certain names. For example, Rancheria is an old-time name. So, like, you have up in um, uh, Sonoma County and, and um, people from Marin, too, you have the Federated Indians of the Creighton Rancheria. Rancheria is a, a name for a reservation. Okay, good. Uh, you just brought a subject I was going to ask about. You watch television nowadays. Within a few days, the Great and Rancheria Casino is going to open. I'm wondering how the native people are going to um, benefit from that, and how do you identify a native person to get those benefits? Actually, Maypalm played a big role in that, uh, the identification for the Coast Miwok people are one of our founders of our organization, Sylvia Thalman, um, actually spent hundreds or thousands of hours actually tracing people's ancestries so that the people that are in the Federated Indians, the Great Rancheria, which are almost all Coast Miwok, there are some Pomo people too that are from that territory, um, they've actually had their ancestry really you know, carefully identified. As far as benefits go, um, the tribe is, has scholarships, it's, it's providing, you know, different kinds of, I hope it's going to provide housing for the elders and so on. Uh, usually, um, well, from what I've seen, um, I think it's going to be really beneficial to the Coast Miwok people, um, whatever your opinion is about the, the casino. I don't want to get into that. Okay, more questions? Yes. Watch over here. Back to the baskets, I was wondering, um, how did they seal them to hold water? That's a really good question. If you take a basket, a basket's like a wooden boat. If you take a wooden boat and you leave it out of the water, it's the caulk between the, the different um, uh, bits of the way the, the wooden boat's made, it's going to break and, and the, the boat's not going to stay water tight. But basket is wood, it's wood products. And when it's got water in it, they swell. And, and, and the basket basically um, seals itself so the water doesn't run out of it. The other thing is when you cook in a basket, little tiny particles of the food material basically caulk in, be in the different tiny openings that are there. And so the basket becomes completely watertight. If you look at old cooking baskets, even though they're dried out now, you can still see that there are virtually no holes in them. They're still watertight to this day. Amazing. The great answer. <laughs> Pardon me? I want to just commend Ralph on this great answer to the question. Yeah, well, I mean, the word expert means you know your subject thoroughly. And I can't imagine uh, 
two people more versed in, the, in this wonderful subject and helping us discover California native peoples. And we are deeply indebted to you for being here tonight. We hope that you enjoyed the evening and hope that you will come back and uh, maybe see our next uh, presentation of Hooked on Marin as we take a look at Star Wars and all the great special effects uh, executed by Mr. Uh, uh, why can't I remember his name? He's such a good friend of mine. Lauren, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> what a good pal. What's his name? And uh, then, of course, we're also going to be taking a look at trains in Marin County, the history of that. And uh, our last uh, show in January for the season will be Marin Rock and Rollers. Ladies and gentlemen, please, another warm welcome and uh, appreciation. <laughs> Benny Girk, Ralph Shanks. And thank you very much. And thank you to Drake High School and the wonderful communications department for taping tonight. Thank you, everybody. And please, spend some time at the tables. <laughs> Sounds like Las Vegas. <laughs>